Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at Silico Roundabout. My name is Francesco. I'm one of the directors of Silico Roundabout, the largest tech meetup in Europe. And today, I have the pleasure to bring to you this webinar sponsored by Tmart and the Tmart team led by Liviu. Liviu and Tmart are a company helping startup with their development and engineering by providing outsourcing products and uh, remote stuff, which uh, will help, I guess, many of you in the communities. And if you would like to reach out to them to ask any questions about expanding your team in a, an agile way or uh, provide proof of concepts and MVPs uh, or scale up your existing team, then feel free to reach out to them. We're very, very grateful that they allow us to be today with this event. And now to the actual topic. Today's event, as you've probably seen on the headers, is about how to strategically align the business objectives with the development goals of your startup. Uh, and it's something that uh, even more mature companies sometimes struggle with. Uh, and to provide an answers and a framework to work with into this space, Today, I've got uh, the pleasure to have Alex Bobocca, CEO and Digital Portfolio Leader at Mosaic Works, and Maria Diacono, CEO and Founder at Mosaic Works. That will lead today's event and explain to you exactly what frameworks to use and how to best align the business and the development features of your startup. And so, without further ado, Alex, Maria, do you want to take it from here? Sure. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here tonight. Thank you, Francesco. We are part of Mosaic Works team. I'm Maria Diakono, CEO and founder of Mosaic Works. And uh, I'm leading Mosaic Works team since 2008. Uh, we are, we've been one of the first uh, teams helping uh, with agile transformations in Europe back in 2008. And uh, uh, we are working with product teams again since 2008 to create successful digital products and uh, to become uh, more agile in uh, business. We are very happy that this year we've been uh, awarded uh, with uh, being company of the year by CIO Application Europe. We've been voted by C-level executives in, uh, in Europe as uh, being one of the top agile company uh, offering uh, consulting and uh, advisory for transforming customer businesses. We are having customers in uh, 15 countries in Europe and in the United States. And uh, in this session, we will share from our experience working with uh, product teams, one of the major issues being the disconnect between the features that are implemented and the business goals. Uh, I will let uh, Alex share more about the, the techniques that we are using. Well, just a selection of uh, the techniques that we are using. Alex? Thank you, Maria. Uh, so I'm very happy to, to be here today and to uh, have an interesting chat. Hopefully, I'll just present quickly some of the techniques that we've been using with our customers. And I hope that they will help, but of course we cannot go, go into a lot of depth related to these techniques. And therefore I will uh, be happy to answer your questions related to them and how they can uh, be applied in your context uh, in, at the end of, of this presentation. Uh, I like to have interactivity with the audience uh, since we are now in the age of remote presentations and all kinds of remote conferences and things like that. I looked for a tool that can help us have a little interaction. So we, we are using today Mentimeter. 
uh, you can interact uh, with the, the presentation by going to menti.com and using the code that was posted in the chat. And this will uh, allow you to answer some questions and we'll get to know each other better, have some interactivity, learn more from your experience and see how, how we can place the topics that we are discussing uh, today. So the main topic of today is how to strategically align business and product features. We noticed a few years ago that as companies were moving towards agility, they had more and more uh, teams working, but they still had this problem of lack of alignment. The business wanted something, the developers were building something else. It was very hard to make a connection between the two. Uh, development teams had no idea why they were building what they were building and all kinds of things like this. And this results in missed opportunities. We, don't, we are missing opportunities for um, options, you are missing opportunities for better user experience for your customers or for better technical uh, implementations in some cases. And that's why we looked at a few techniques and we started applying them for us as uh, digital product uh, leaders, but also helping other companies uh, implement them and deal with these uh, solutions. Now, like every solution, um, there is not a perfect solution uh, for, for these uh, situations. These are very complex situations. Uh, these help alleviate some of the problems and uh, support, uh, support you to get better alignment. Uh, but of course, uh, there are many other techniques that you can probably use. However, today we'll focus on a few specific ones. Uh, impact mapping and user story mapping. But before we do that, if you've already uh, joined menti.com with this code, we can now meet each other. And you can start voting. This will be interesting to see if you can uh, vote on the role that fits you best. Uh, it would be interesting to see what kind of audience we have today. Uh, from founders, product managers. I know sometimes these roles are not perfectly aligned with what I've written here, but just pick the one that, uh, that matches you the closest. Uh, and uh, this will get us started a little bit. Now, as a uh, for myself, I have been uh, developing software as a programmer and then as a software architect and uh, led some teams as a project manager for, for a number of years. And then I switched to uh, agile development and also to training and helping other companies achieve these things. And I've learned a lot during this uh, journey. Uh, so I started as a technical person, but now I am in a place where I feel best when I can solve problems, uh, when I can solve real problems, usually with software, but not necessarily with software. Uh, all right, so we have only two votes until now, one founder and one, one other. People are a bit shy of using this, uh, this tool. But I will uh, I'll continue and then we can um, uh, hopefully you will uh, discuss, you will answer some uh, other questions as we, uh, we advance. Uh, this is more like a setup for, for us. Uh, thank you for answering. So the main question that we are asking today is how to create successful digital products. Uh, and because this question is a very uh, difficult question, I will make a few assumptions. I will assume that you have a product idea and that the, the product idea is valid, is fit to the market, so it has some value in it. It's not just a, a, a weird, crazy idea, it's something that's actually um, useful. 
you have enough money and time to implement it. I know this is uh, perhaps a very uh, uh, an assumption that is very uh, wide, uh, but we'll go with it. You have your teams are efficient if you are working with one or more teams. If you give them something to do, they know how to do it efficiently. And you can manage your competition. So this means that you have fewer reasons to fail uh, with products. We know that product uh, development uh, fails more often than not, but uh, you have fewer reasons to fail. And the problem is that even under these best circumstances, under these best assumptions, mm -hmm. you can still fail. Um, and so what I would like to ask you if you have, uh, now you can again write a few words regarding some ways in which your past products have failed. If you've been involved in past product, what were reasons for that? Uh, were you lacking money? Were you uh, didn't have enough time? Okay, we are starting to see some uh, some replies, uh, lack of traction. Let's see a few others. Um, it would be interesting to see. Uh, some, some answers, no investor interest. I'll, I'll try to wait for a minute or two and see if we can get more for a few seconds. All right, so uh, difficult, difficulty closing, no tech feedback, lack of automation. All right, so very interesting reasons. Um, and this would be very interesting to discuss at, at the end of this talk, perhaps. You can keep them in mind while I'll talk about the techniques uh, that we are discussing today and then see if uh, some of these could have been, could have helped you. And you can ask more questions based on the previous context. Okay, five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. Thank you for answering. Um, a few typical reasons that we see under these best circumstances are the misalignment between business and development. So what happens so often is that um, business wants something, development doesn't quite understand what the business wants, and they start filling in the gaps and building something else. And often it's very difficult to understand what the developers are doing, as we will see uh, in a few moments. Another reason that we often see is uh, something called pet features. When the business people or the product people, they really want a feature. And even that, though that feature doesn't actually have a clear uh, contribution to a business goal. Another thing that we've seen is communication issues. Uh, so there are issues with the communication inside the organization. This can happen even in very small organizations where the product owner or, or the product person uh, doesn't get to communicate well enough with the developers or the developers don't know how to explain the problems that they are facing to product and business people in words that, that they can understand. And of course, another one would be human errors. Human errors happen, uh, although I would say this is probably the last one as a contribution to, uh, to failure. Usually we see some of the other three happening uh, and often together in concert. So another way of thinking about the uh, pet features is to 
think about the uh, Yander Pen's known problem. Uh, this is inspired by an episode in South Park where uh, the kids from South Park discovered that other pens are disappearing all over the city and they follow them and they find out that some gnomes are stealing other pens. And when they are um, discussing with the chief gnome about this and asking, okay, why do you do that? The plan is that the chief gnome presents is phase one, collect thunder pens, phase two, no idea, phase three, profit. And we see the same thing happening with product teams. So phase one, come up with a feature idea. Phase two, we don't know what we are doing there, but phase three, we will definitely get some profit. And this is a, a problem that's often contributing to uh, failures in product development because implementing new features in a product is costly, uh, especially when these are custom features, and then they require maintenance. So they cost not only in the time required for development, but also in the time after required for maintenance. Another problem that we have seen, so we discussed about the idea of this disconnect problem between business or product people and uh, developers. And when you ask a CEO or a founder, what are the business goals? Uh, they will tell you something like improve customer satisfaction, increase brand awareness, find new markets, expand products or services, uh, enter new markets, reduce operational costs and so on. It's some, some of the, the reasons uh, from this list are probably business reasons that, that will come from a C-level person. However, when you go and discuss with developers, this is what you'll see, especially developers doing some kind of agile software development. They will have a bunch of post-its on a wall, or they will have some tickets in a tool usually Jira, but not only. And uh, while these are very useful for developers, there is no clear connection between the business goal and the actual things that they are developing. And then it's very hard to figure out the context. This is a problem from two sides. From one side, the business and product people cannot understand fully what developers are working on unless they have a strong technical background. Developers don't know why they are working on these specific things and not on other things. And again, sometimes they fill in the blanks and they start working on, on things that are more interesting from a technical perspective. I know, I, I am a programmer. Another problem that we see is, uh, is very often a misunderstanding of the roadmap. A roadmap should not be a road. Usually when we think about roadmaps, we think about in Q2, we need to do these features. In Q3, we need to do these features. In Q4, we need to do these features. This is a road. It's not a roadmap. A roadmap is something like this. It's something that tells you, so if I have a specific goal uh, to, to go from, let's say, Bucharest to London, uh, I can go there by car, I can go there by train, I can go there through three different ways by car or by plane. And these, these are options. If one of the roads is blocked, I can always pick up another option and keep moving forward. This is what the roadmap should be. It should provide us options for achieving a business goal. But we are not doing this. We are usually doing roads. And so the question is, what can we do to alleviate these problems? And let's see a few options. First of all, in terms of the tools that we need to use, we need techniques that, are, that have a few characteristics. It needs to be collaborative, first of all, because we need to put developers, product people, business people together, uh, and they need to collaborate. And I know it's not always easy, uh, it's not always easy to get the time to do that. It's not always easy to um, communicate, but this is where the power of uh, 
collaboration will get you to the line. We need techniques that are visual because uh, we can communicate visually better than in words or in other ways. And we need techniques that are effective. We cannot spend like uh, one month figuring out uh, alignment between development and business people and product people. They need to be uh, quite fast. And they need to enable experiments because we know product development can fail and we need to be able to experiment in the market and figure out what works and what doesn't. And so without further ado, I will introduce you to the first technique, which is called impact mapping. Um, as a result, you build an impact map. And an impact map is uh, a restricted mind map. Uh, if you don't know what mind maps are, mind maps are a very useful technique for structuring knowledge, uh, where you have a core node, uh, and that expands into child nodes and each child node can expand into multiple nodes and so on. And it's a very good technique that allows you to start from a general problem and then detail, uh, well, details about the, the, the specifics uh, of the problem. Um, it's very powerful because it maps the way we store knowledge in the brain and it's very natural. Uh, for anybody who does analysis uh, to, to apply. In this case, we'll use a restricted mind map, which means that every node has a specific uh, role. It's not something that is general, and we will go into details in a few moments. It links the business goal with features. In fact, the first node that you see, the core node on the left, reduced transaction cost by 10%, that is a business goal. We start from a business goal and then we think about the rest and we end with the features. We have ideas of features that might help us achieve the business goal. It gives us options and I will enter into more details after we discuss the impact map. But remember this, that uh, am I, an impact map shows us the options for achieving our goal. We don't have to implement every feature that is uh, on the end of the impact map, we just need to see the options and then pick the ones that are more likely to uh, help us. And it answers a few questions. Why are we doing what we are doing? The business goal. Who? Uh, the actors. Uh, who can help uh, our, achieve, us achieve our goal? How can they do that by impact? This, level is what gives impact in its name and what is the little features. So let's look at this a bit in large. This is just one example. Um, we can think of many more examples and I'll give you some resources for uh, how to build an impact map at the end. But for now, let's go through this example because it's quite easy to understand and you'll see that an impact map by itself is not a very complex or complicated uh, idea, but is very powerful and done properly uh, and done collaboratively with everybody involved. Uh, and we'll see how to use it uh, in a few moments. Let's focus for now on how it's built. So we start from a goal, business goal, reduce transaction costs by 10%. These goals tend to be about money. Uh, they are about reducing costs, uh, increasing revenue, uh, protecting some money, for example, not paying GDPR fines or uh, things related to uh, money, to specific business goals. And then we have a few actors. Uh, the actors can be organizations or users or roles uh, that can help us or impede us from achieving this goal. In this case, uh, the impact map is about uh, financial applications. So we start from the goal to reduce transaction costs by 10%. And then if we go on the first level, we have a German settlement team, which is an actor um, that can help us uh, achieve this goal. The next question is, 
the impact. And what the impact means is what is uh, changing behavior for the actors that would help us achieve our goal. So we want the German settlement team to process important exceptions faster. And in order to do that, we need to provide them with a feature. And the feature would be to exception reports, presumably to see uh, the important exceptions uh, better in the report and prioritize exceptions which will show the exceptions on top of the report probably. So if we have uh, these two features, we now have a clear answers to why we are doing what we are doing. We want to improve exception reports so that the German settlement team can process important exception faster which would contribute to reducing the transaction costs. This is the power of this technique. And one important thing about it is that, as I said, you don't have to implement everything from here. It's a true roadmap. It just gives you possible options to achieve your goal. Your goal is to reduce transaction costs by 10%. So you could, for example, look at this and say, Okay, so we can optimize performance of existing hardware, the last one from IT Ops, and uh, inform traders about potential exceptions early and improve exception reports. Let's try to implement these things. Let's see what impact it has on uh, transaction costs. If the impact has been reduced by 10%, we throw away the, the impact map and we figure out the next one. If we still need to do some more work, then we continue doing some more work uh, and implementing more features. And this is the big difference between uh, a road and a road. We don't have to implement everything. We just need to achieve the goal uh, of the business. So how to use this impact map? Uh, first of all, it's used for alignment. And the way we build an impact map is by um, achieving alignment is by bringing together uh, senior business people, senior product people, senior technical people, for example, your architects or, or senior people who, who know and can understand and make the connection with the business quite easily. Because we want everybody to be aligned. We want everybody to be involved. We want everybody to collaborate and to come up with ideas. It gives us options to achieve the business goal. It allows us to achieve the business goal uh, by seeing a lot of options. Um, and it gives context for the development team. Once you build this impact map, it's best to print it or just draw it and post it in the developer's room or in a tool where they can see it daily, ideally. It's best if it's in a room, but sometimes things are remote, and especially in this period, we need to, other ways to make these things very visible. Because it has to be very clear why we are working on specific features. This will give the development team context in order to implement faster certain features because they will understand why they are doing that. And it's also a true roadmap, as we said, allows us to go through different options and uh, achieve our goal. So the most important part of this is do not implement everything from an impact map. It's very easy to build one and we get really excited and implement everything. The only reason to implement everything from an impact map is if you haven't uh, achieved your business goal after, uh, unless you implemented everything. But in that case, what I would suggest is that you need to think about more options and be more imaginative when you come up with options when building the impact. So I'll not go into a lot more details about this. Uh, this is how the impact map looks. There's much more here about uh, the specifics of each uh, node and how to build it, how to facilitate a meeting where you can build this uh, impact map and uh, so on. But 
I think it's enough to get you started and ask some questions that fit your context. And then we can, I can give you some more details based on what you, what you need to learn. A second technique that we will talk uh, about today is a user story map. Again, this is a technique that is visual, collaborative, and it allows us to align. In this case, the alignment is more towards user, towards the user needs. Uh, often we are working with companies that want to switch from uh, their current type of the thinking, which is more like project oriented, let's do this project and so on, and be more customer focused. And this is uh, where this technique is uh, exceptionally powerful. So let's look for a moment at how a typical backlog looks like. Uh, if you look at the uh, Agile team, you usually see a long list of things. Um, and the problem with this is that you get, don't get a lot of context for the items on the backlog. But if you have seen the backlog, it would be interesting to uh, find out what problems have you seen with backlogs in the past. And, I will wait again for a few 30 seconds or so to see if you have some past experiences with backlogs that, that didn't work so well. Items get stale in there, yes. Uh, very common problem. Uh, people keep adding things to the backlog, but don't remove things from the backlog. The broader team doesn't get the full picture. Exactly, it's it's lacking context. Uh, sometimes you have the small post-its that are just very specific tasks, uh, and you don't fully understand what why developers are working on that. Okay. Anybody else? Sometimes technical. People are dating it correctly and on time. That's great to hear. You had a good experience with uh, with a backlog. That's cool. Right. Five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you for for answering. Uh, the biggest problem that we see with backlog items is that they tend to lack context. You start from a specific business goal or for a specific objective, but then you start breaking these things into smaller and smaller things that end up having almost no context. And if you ask a developer, why do we build that specific backlog item, they will don't know what to tell you. And on the other hand, if you come as an outsider, as a C-level, for example, and start reading items from the backlog, you often don't understand what's the connection between them and the features that you are building. Another common problem that we see is that um, is with a technique called user stories, which many agile teams are using. Well, and user stories are a way of writing these backlog items that answer three questions. Uh, for whom is this important? What are we doing? And why are we doing it? But we still see a lot of uh, user stories that look like this. This is a bit of an extreme example, but we often see user stories that look like, uh, not exactly like this, but similar. As a user, I want to log in. This has a lot of problems. First of all, there is no such thing as a user. We don't know about the specific person or persona who is using our products. Second, nobody wants to log in. And third, uh, we don't know uh, why we need this. What is the value for the user? And so, Instead of thinking like that, instead of having this kind of items, we can think differently. We can start from what does the user need? We want to be customer focused because if we are customer focused, then we will get more uh, 
people excited about our product. And in order to do that, we need to really think about what does the user need. And the user doesn't need to use your product. The user needs to accomplish a task. They need to book an accommodation, book a trip, buy something, and so on. They don't need the, to use the product. Your product is a tool for them to accomplish a task. And of course, there's no such thing as the user. I worked for a customer in the past uh, who was building a GP, an application for a GP um, medical uh, cabinet. And a 25 years old doctor is very different from a 65 years old doctor. A uh, 25 years old doctor would probably know how to use a specific uh, uh, you know, modern technology and so on. A 65 years old uh, doesn't know, doesn't quite want to learn, uh, has a poor eyesight and so on and so forth. So these two are like two different worlds. So let's think about the user when we build a backlog. That's the big idea. Instead of starting from a flat list, let's think about as a user. And this is where user story mapping comes in because user story mapping defines the journey of a persona. We need to define a persona in order to accomplish a task. So we need to know what task we need to accomplish. What are the steps for that person or persona to uh, accomplish that task? And we build a two-dimensional backlog that preserves context. And the best way to think about, to understand user story maps is to see examples. Um, we, we often notice that when we introduce the people to user story mapping, it's actually a very natural thing to do uh, once you get into this mindset of what does the user want. So in this case, you have um, uh, a user that needs to uh, use a client, an animate client application. So what are some of the tasks that they need to do? They need to organize email, they need to manage email, they need to manage the calendar, they need to manage contacts. Simple tasks, we can all relate to these. And the next level is if you want to organize emails, what are the steps that you need to do to accomplish this task? Well, you can search for emails, file emails. If you want to manage email, compose, read, delete. If you want to manage a calendar, view, create appointment, and so on. And then we can go into ideas on how to implement these subtasks for the user. So search email, you can search by keyword, you can even search to one field, you can even search to more fields, you can search attachments, search subfolders, and so on and so forth. And as you can see, this kind of two-dimensional backlog also allows us to draw lines and say, this is our first release, this is our second release, this is our third release. Uh, by the way, when I think about these releases, I like to think about them more like increments, which should be quite small. It should be something that you can implement between one and three sprints, you know, so two to six weeks. Uh, not something really big, because you need to get, uh, get going. So this is what the user story map is. It's not a big idea. It's a big idea in the sense that it's a two-dimensional backlog, and you can use it in a few different ways. First, you can build it collaboratively by thinking about the user. You can validate it with users. Um, sometimes you can ask the user, are these the tasks that you want to do? Are these the steps you go to? Do, do this map your mental model about these tasks. You can also make some uh, UX prototypes based on that and test them out uh, very quickly with users. But then it's also very useful to uh, split into releases and to see as a map of things that you can, uh, um, shows you where you are and how far you, you need to go, how far you have done. So this is uh, 
that we found that the lot we have a user story map, we have a time, we have user activities, uh, the user tasks, and then a few uh, user stories, but they now have a clear context that we are doing. So how to use them? We've already discussed validate with users, build collaboratively, uh, involve architects or uh, product or uh, senior developers in it. And you can also start from an impact map because if you have a clear goal, then you can, and you have a few ideas for features. Some of those features are actually a specific flow in your application and not a very a simple uh, implementation. It can also serve as a progress map because you can check out the things that you've implemented and you see how much you've done from it. Okay, so the big, bigger conclusion besides these two techniques is if you want alignment, you need to use something that's collaborative, visual, open, and something that can stay over time, over longer periods of time, because in that way, you as a business person can go to developers and ask them kind of where are you on this map? And perhaps you can innovate and create some other types of maps of your own. A few resources you can read about impact mapping in the book by Greg Kozic, you just search for impact mapping on Google or Amazon and you'll find it. User story mapping, it's a book by Jeff Patton, you can find it again on Amazon. Uh, um, we at Mosaic Works, we have an online learning program uh, for both impact mapping and user story mapping. If you just visit craftacademy.mosaicworks.com, you'll find uh, the, uh, our programs, our learning programs. And I'd like to leave you with one thing that is very relevant to this. There is nothing as useless as being efficiently that we should not be done at all by Peter Drucker. This is something that we should all keep in mind when uh, trying to develop strategies. Thank you. And uh, I am now open for questions. Uh, initially, I had the questions uh, in uh, Antimeter, but you can, uh, uh, I understand that you ask questions through through the webinar, so that is all for me for now. So, punches. Uh, Yes, so by the way, just reminding everyone, um, you can either use the Q&A slots below or the, uh, or the link that, uh, that's in the chat, uh, yeah. then if yeah. you can all see it. Yeah, so I can see uh, actually one question here. How can startups best implement this at the very... A very good question. Uh, so... Uh, in fact, it's uh, the best idea to start with impact map for defining the business goals and to define the strategy of a product with impact map at the beginning in the first phase after you have just the idea of the product. I've been working with startups uh, in Europe as an advisor and mentor. And this is something that we've been working together. So it's just applying the uh, technique that look simple at the beginning, but when we start implementing it, we can see that there are various angles that uh, we need to cover. So uh, what I suggest is to start from the uh, business goals that we are having and then to just uh, design the, the impact map and then uh, to in the next phase to uh, start building the user story map again with the business goals in the center and also the defined persona in the center so this means that 
there are some prerequisites. We need to define what are the um, most important users of our apps, of our products, and uh, to define the persona, uh, and then to move further with re the relation between the business goals, the behavior of the user, and then the features written in the story map format. Alex, if you want uh, to add something. If I can add a few things so you can. Uh, ideally, when you build the impact app for a startup, you start seeing some growth cycles inside. So, for example, one feature could be we want the, uh, existing users to bring more users. This would be a nice goal to have. And often what I noticed uh, is that it can be very helpful when doing the impact maps for startups uh, because you start identifying these growth cycles. You start seeing them in the impact map. A second thing that I would um, get to related to startups, one of the things with startups is that you need to validate very quickly some ideas. Exactly. Um, user story maps allow you to figure out what is the need of the users, at least your hypothesis for the need exactly. of the users. And then you can go into things like UX prototypes, which you can very quickly test and see if it's actually something useful for users. And you learn now very quickly whether it's useful or not. Um, and also with impact map, one great thing is uh, to focus on the first most important parts of, uh, as a business goal. And that's actually the hardest part of the thing, coming out with a goal that is actually a, can be accomplished. Uh, it's very easy to start from the idea of we want to have a million users, but you won't get a million users in six weeks so or most, three months. Yeah, so most probably you will start with, I want to validate this idea, how I can do this, what's the first objective, and how can I um, understand if my idea uh, works. And next, okay, if I have right now 10 users, how can I increase to 1,000 users? So it goes in increments uh, and uh, we need to understand in the larger goal, like, okay, I want to have 1 million users, in fact, starts with having one user first and then 10 users and then 1,000 and hopefully 10,000 and so on and so forth. And this means that for every smaller goal, we need a roadmap to achieve this goal. These are the questions that we are uh, focusing on and it gives us, the beauty of these techniques are that it, it gives us focus. We really understand what step are we in and we, we dedicate our four resources on accomplishing one goal that it's also shared and clearly understood because it's visual, it's simple, it's put in a very simple format and everyone involved in building the product can easily uh, relate to that direction. Okay, so I mark this as answer. What about Cucumber and the best way to integrate this with BBB? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll let problem. you answer. Yeah. So first of all, uh, when you think about impact map that's higher level than BDD, um, there is no connection there. BDD starts at the moment when you have an idea for a feature that you'd like to implement. So it's like the end of the impact map. And that's when you can actually start doing the BDD, the BDD specs, uh, the BDD analysis, the conversation part with the BDD. And by the way, when we are talking about behavior-driven development, I see that you are talking about Cucumber here, but the most important part of behavior-driven development is the conversation between uh, the product people and the technical people to figure out uh, the, the cases that need to be implemented. Uh, so once you have a feature, you can start doing this analysis, you can start writing down the given and then, uh, scenarios, but without actually automating them, because the first thing you need to do is to have this conversation, the second thing you need to do is to write these scenarios, 
and only if you want to, you need to write the automated test. It's not absolutely necessary. This is advice from BDD specialists, so, so not only from me. Um, so it's a great idea to do impact map, go into uh, feature. With a feature, if it's a more complex feature, it's like a flow, do the story map for that, and then go on each small story and do the BDD analysis, write a given random scenarios. This will give you a clearer idea of what you need to implement and only do that for those uh, items that are actually valuable, that are deemed valuable by the business, by the product. And not, not for everything. We don't want to build for everything. Uh, but this would be like a very quick answer. Can impact mapping help manage remote developers? Um, I mean, it helps. Uh, it helps aligning. Yes, it helps. Even with remote developers, uh, there are a few things that you need to pay attention to. Though, um, an impact map and every kind of visual artifact is much more powerful when it's visual in the team room. Uh, so when it's stick on the wall, when you can come into the room and you see it immediately, this is when it has the most power. Well, right now, as we are working remotely, it's good for everyone to just have it um, in a place that can be easily accessible and every day, preferably every day, to be referred to when executing every user story. Because, again, many times we as developers, we forget uh, the, the larger context and we lose the connection between the need of the business and uh, what needs to be implemented. Um, another challenge is when um, building the internet, because you should have, if you have senior people from remote areas, they should be involved in building the internet. Fortunately, there are very good online tools for building mind maps. So one of them is mindmeister.com. Uh, and they, those allow you to collaboratively build the mind map. You can also use Miro.com, uh, which allows you various options for collaboration. And these are tools that will solve some of the problems, at least to collaborate on that. And then what I would do is I would make sure that on every daily meeting, or at least on the weekly meeting, start from the impact map show the impact map, look at it and say, okay, so how are we doing with this? Where are we? We are here, we're doing this. Just remember these things. Many times it's enough to uh, refer to impact mapping and planning meetings. This means once a week or every two weeks at least, but uh, no longer than that. Okay, what's the best way for people from different parts of the companies to participate, sales programmers, etc. So before the pandemic, I would have said, <laughs> get everybody in the same room uh, for a specific period of time. A, an impact map is not that hard to build. So there are a few steps that you need to do beforehand with the executives, uh, figure out the business goal, force them to get the business goal that is clear and small enough so that you can make specific, a, a specific mm -hmm. enough that you can actually uh, implement. But uh, once you have this, the actual uh, timing for building an in-time map is two to four hours. It's not that, uh, that hard to set up. Uh, now, because of uh, the, the pandemic, we need to collaborate remotely and once again, it's best to use uh, tools like Miro.com and things like this. Bring everybody in a virtual room for uh, two to four hours. You can also split into multiple sessions. So, so you can build, for example, a first branch, a second branch, and then stop and come back the next day and build two more branches and so on. What's also important is to have a facilitator that it's uh, good at facilitation uh, I've seen it many times that uh, the, this, these are um, important discussions that need facilitation and need the facilitator to 
uh, understand and to be able to uh, help the people get the most from these discussions. So again, the importance of facilitator is without one, most probably you won't get uh, the best result that you can. Yeah. And it's not good. Imagine the, the worst case scenario when business people start arguing with the developers and you don't get anywhere. So you need facilitation. You need somebody who comes there and kind of forces everybody to move forward and reminds everybody why they are doing this and takes their side. Okay, what tools do you use to manage requirements that are beyond current technical limitations? Uh, I am not sure I understand this question. If you are talking about things uh, that I, I see, I usually call moonshots, so kind of weird ideas that we can try, but we don't know whether they work or not. Um, for this, uh, Usually what I would recommend is something called spikes, where you define a specific time where you say, I don't know, we want to implement a different technical thing or I don't know, a 3D graph or a 3D report or whatever. Uh, and start with the, by defining a small problem from the big mm -hmm. problem uh, and ask uh, the development team who wants to take this and try it out, but they only have like two days or three days. And exactly. after two or three days, they have to show something and say, okay, so this is what I learned, this is what works, this is what doesn't, I don't know how to do this and so on. Uh, and then make smaller decisions based on this, uh, on this progress. Uh, typically in these situations, you don't know the timeline. You don't know mm -hmm. how long it will take, you don't know whether you will be able to implement this. Um, so the best idea is to run technical experiments, but make sure that you, uh, you know, I'm a programmer and we tend to get drawn into the technical stuff and it gets really fun to try out a lot of things and, and before yeah. you know it, two months have passed and, and you haven't done anything. This is why we need to just stick with a limited time box uh, period of time. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but if you if I, we haven't, then please ask another one that clarifies. Okay, no more questions. Uh, I think that well, we're actually like pretty much spot on because you know it's like we're two minutes to to the yes. end. So, do we have like a very last question before before we close off the verb, the webinar? doesn't seem to be any. Uh, well, I would like to thank the audience uh, for, for participating. It's been very interesting, uh, very interesting to see your questions. And I hope these techniques can help you once again. Um, they are quite easy to learn. Uh, just remember to, to use them, uh, kind of read the books or go through uh, an online course to learn how to do them and then get a facilitator. Uh, once you have this in place, then you will most likely start seeing some improvements in, in your success rate for products. And if, if you have more questions, feel free to ask uh, either Silicon Roundabout or Mosaic World directly and uh, we are happy to answer. And uh, we, are, we are happy to help startups as it's uh, we we also have our own product and we we've been there. We are also founders on some uh, pro products and we know how difficult and hard it is. So we are uh, happy to help.